the leopard and her cub. And now we're going to get very close here and so we're going to drive nice and slow and easy and try not to make too much noise. So if you'll tell me when you've got a decent shot, eh? There she is. Say when. Okay. Now, nice and still, everybody. Don't move too much in your seats, wherever you happen to be in the world. Our beard, you say, how old is the cub? When we first saw the cubs, and that was in the oh, second or third week of January, at least of February this year, I figured them to be between six and eight weeks old. So I'm going to give them a birth date around about the 1st of January. And therefore, well, she's about five and a half months. And Shadow, you can see, is desperately upset by how close we're sitting to her. <laughs> it really is very special how confiding she is. And while a lion sitting completely flat tends to put one to sleep in this manner of chloroform. It's just not quite the same with a leopard. You sit with a flat leopard for quite a while because they will, they will eventually lift their heads and do something interesting. Now Earl, you're wondering how I know this is shadow. Earl, there are a number of ways of doing it. For me, it's that spot pattern there that Seb's showing you. She's a 3-4 female, like her mother as far as I remember it. Um, she's just nodding off now. She's got three spots there on the left-hand side of her, of yes. as you're looking at her, the left-hand side of her muzzle, so her right, and then on the right-hand side, on our right, her left, there are four spots just above the whisker line there. You can't see them unless she actually lifts her head and looks at you. But as the old cliché goes, a leopard doesn't change its spots, which means that they're born with a specific pattern of spots. And her mother, of course, Karula, had that wow written across the front of her forehead. Uh, she, all of these spots will form patterns, and some people use the necklace that is under the neck. That is very clear on most leopards, not on this one, because she's dropped off. Uh, but there's a sort of necklace of spots below the chin and under the neck, and that is some used by some people. But eventually, because they're territorial, you just start to recognize them. She has got a slightly shorter face than some leopards. She's got quite a wrinkly muzzle, and so she's quite easily recognizable by that. You can see it's a little bit wrinkly there. She's pale. She doesn't have a golden color. She's got a much more sort of off-white, creamish, creamy color. And, yeah, she's got a certain attitude to her as well, of course, and I think she's got the most brilliant name. I think Shadow is a wonderful name for her. She will disappear at a moment's notice if she doesn't want to be seen. But those are the ways you recognize them. And they're important, that, because it can be easy to kind of get complacent about it, because what happens is that you start to see a leopard in a certain area. If it's a female, you just make the assumption that you know you know who it is, you know who the territorial animal is in that area. But it's always a good idea just to check. Check the spot pattern, check out who it is carefully, because leopards often don't uh, adhere to the rules. Now, Richard, you're wondering if she pulls, will pull the kill into a tree to consume it. Richard, most leopards do, especially in areas like this where there is a high concentration of hyenas and lions. This leopard is particularly poor at doing that, and in fact, she is renowned for not taking her kills into trees. And we think that that might be one of the reasons that she's lost every single cub she's had to date, uh, because she doesn't hoist kills. What that means, of course, is that when this kill starts to smell fairly rank, which if the temperature continues like it is, it will, it will happen in the next day or so, it will attract scavengers. And those scavengers will be an immense threat to a little cub that is feeding on a carcass. And the cub is quite capable of climbing trees, quite capable of feeding 
from the carcass in trees, but this leopardess just doesn't hoist. And that does mean that her cubs are more vulnerable than others might be if, you know, compared with those who hoist. And I don't, I, I personally don't buy that. I don't, I think it's a certainly an added factor. But I think that the reason she's been unsuccessful is I think that she, it's not her fault at all. I think she's got a genetic, uh, a genetic predisposition to coming into estrus too soon. And she expects her cubs to go independent too soon. She abandons them too quickly. And they're not able to fend for themselves. And Leopard, of course, needs very little teaching. Her most wonderful story and her most wonderful or most interesting story, I think, is the story of her one surviving offspring. And and this will be we'll be able to use this use this uh, story to answer Tweety Tweet's question, who's just said, would she learn? Would the new cub have to learn how to take the kill into a tree, or would she? Um, which you know by instinct. Her one remaining cub is remaining because she w he was removed from the reserve for about six months. Maybe the little one's coming now. Removed from the reserve for about six months. He had to go into rehab. I love saying that because it sounds so ridiculous. But he had to go into rehab because he caught a rabid dog and they didn't know if he was going to get rabies or not. So they took him out, put him in a rehabilitation centre and then reintroduced him here six or seven months later. And it's a wonderful example of how a leopard's instinctual ability to kill exists because he survived fine. We don't know where he is now, but that's totally normal for a dispersal male leopard. And we certainly did see him kill. We know that he killed. We know that he hoisted his kills. And so he, despite the fact, in fact, when he caught that rabid dog, the first thing he did was drag it up a tree. And the dog, <laughs> in the end, quite an amusing story, but the dog pretended to be dead. It lay in the top of the tree, and you could just see its eye kind of opening every so often. And then as the leopard looked down and it would shut its eye again, um, in the end it wasn't, it wasn't dead. Uh, it is now. And it was a great example of how here's a mother who never hoists her kills, or very, very seldom, and there was a leopard with the instinct to do it immediately. And certainly our two favorite little cubs at the moment, Hosanna and Shrongila, the daughters, well, they're actually Shadow's sister, but 10 years her junior, they are avid hoisters of everything. So they will take just about anything they eat up a tree. They've, whether they've learned that from their mother or not, I, I really don't think so. I think it is largely an instinctual behavior. And if you think about the fact that cuckoos, for example, uh, are able to migrate all the way to where they have to go, you know, over continents, <coughs> and they never meet their parents, well, it's pretty clear that programmed into the genetics can be some fairly complicated things. All righty, I can hear some vehicles arriving way in the distance, so we've probably got another 10 minutes or so here. While we sit and wait and see if the cub comes out, let's head back to Jamie and find out what she's got apparently in the bush.